Alors, on, on va continuer avec de l'électrolyse et, et en lien d'ailleurs avec tous ces, tous, tous ces projets de, de e-carburant et de... Et, et c'est euh, la présentation de David Walkerley. Euh, alors, je suis, je, suis, je suis très heureux de, de voir les, les avancées de, 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 de Dioxycle. Yes. <rire> Parce que David était euh, postdoc dans, dans mon laboratoire. Il, donc, c'est un diplômé de l'Université de Cambridge où il a obtenu sa thèse. Il a fait un, une partie de son postdoc ici, au Collège de France, dans mon labo, puis euh, à Stanford. Et euh, il est le cofondateur, avec Sarah Lamaison, de Dioxycle, dont il va nous parler. David En, en, en anglais, désolé. Oui, en anglais, oui. Mal, malgré ses années françaises, euh, his French. His French is fine, it's but. It's fine, uh, it's fine. Mark asked me to do an entire speech, though, in French, and I said I can try, but I, I assure you, you'd much prefer listening to me in English for half an hour than stutter through French for 10 minutes before I just cried. Um, welcome. I'm really I'm sorry to be speaking English at the Collège de France, but I am so honored to be here to talk to you today about everything we're doing at Dioxycle. So Dioxycle, uh, and in general today, I'm going to talk, sorry, I should just say, I'm going to talk about Dioxycle, my company, quite a lot. I'm going to promote it uh, shamelessly, let's say. Dioxycle is a company I started after I left um, the re as a researcher at the Collège de France. Um, previously, I was a researcher at Stanford University, and we focus entirely on the idea of carbon utilization technologies. So I'm going to begin with today. Today, is this how it works? Great. I'm going to start by talking to you about what carbon utilization is. So you'll often hear carbon utilization used in the same sentence as carbon capture and utilization. And the carbon capture, that refers to the process of taking carbon either from the air or from an emission stream and concentrating it to be transported. The carbon utilization part, the bit that I think, oh God, sorry that I am going to talk to you about today is the bit where you transform those carbon emissions into something interesting. The idea being that when you transform those emissions, you form something that no longer leads to global warming. Now, there are a number of different carbon capture technologies available today. Uh, you can hear of things like enhanced oil recovery. I, I don't want to call it evil, but it's not exactly the best carbon utilization strategy. This is where you take carbon emissions and you pump them into the ground. And you pump them specifically near an active oil well, and that causes oil to be pumped out of the ground much easier, trapping the CO2 inside. You can also put CO2 into concrete. So concrete is actually very good at mineralizing CO2, and you can strengthen concrete blocks by pumping CO2 emissions into concrete. And you can form chemicals and fuels from CO2 emissions. So you can take carbon emissions, take advantage of the fact that there's carbon in those emissions, and convert that carbon into interesting chemicals and fuels. So there's all kinds of interesting things you can do with carbon utilization technologies, but I would say they're not all born equal. I would say that some carbon utilization technologies don't necessarily get us to that net zero world that we all want to live in. So things like enhanced oil recovery, these technologies are very good at taking emissions and pumping them into, into the ground. And to some extent, they do lead to a decrease in our carbon uh, dioxide emissions. So uh, every barrel of oil that has been taken out of the ground using enhanced oil recovery has 37% less emissions compared to a regular barrel of oil. But I would argue this doesn't really get us past the dependence we currently have, the problem we currently have with our oil, um, our oil dependence, basically. And that's really a shame because carbon utilization technologies have the potential to be the cure for our current problem. Our problem right now is we take fossil resources we turn them into chemicals and fuels, and then we burn those chemicals and fuels to release CO2. Carbon utilization at its heart can offer the ability to do the opposite. You could take carbon emissions using some fossil energy and convert them into chemicals and fuels. And you'd essentially be making this perfect cycle where we only use the chemicals and fuels that we can produce. And this kind of cycle, this is my personal dream. I'm not sure if everyone sees the world this way, but this is how we believe you could have a society that no longer is dependent on fossil fuels and is no longer accumulating CO2 in the atmosphere. So this is what we're trying to achieve. Big question is, where do you start? 
what is the technology that you need in order to turn those carbon emissions into something useful? Because there's a whole range of different chemical processes you could imagine to get this process off the ground, but which is really the best way forwards? And for us, the answer to that question was the production of ethylene. Now, ethylene is the world's most used organic chemical. It's a $180 billion market every year. And if you can form ethylene from emissions, I think you can do anything. And the reason being, well, not anything, obviously, not everything, but you can do a huge amount of interesting science. If you can form ethylene, you can react ethylene with oxygen to form ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide is a precursor for things like ethylene glycol, epoxides, and you can form things like glues, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, pesticides, uh, what else have I written there? Just a, a huge number of chemicals. And that's just by forming ethylene oxide. You can also react ethylene with itself. And if you react ethylene with itself, you can form fuels. You can turn um, ethylene into hydrocarbon fuels like kerosene or biodiesel. And these fuels can then be burned in airplanes, in, in ships, in, in, in um, camion, lorries. You can also react ethylene with itself enough times to form polymers. And if you form these polymers, you can make materials, packaging materials, textiles, medical devices, synthetic rubbers. There's a huge amount of stuff you can do with ethylene if you react it with itself. But also, you can react ethylene with chlorine. And if you react ethylene with chlorine, you can form vinyl chloride. And vinyl chloride is the precursor to all PVC. And PVC is what we see in, in, in construction, basically. Every window frame, every pipe, every lots of flooring, lots of textiles, lots of construction materials, fashion, interior design. These can all be derived from PVC. So you can see just how much stuff we can generate if we can generate carbon and ethylene from carbon emissions. And that was the mission we had at Dioxycycle. Also, if you can form uh, these chemicals from ethylene, if you can form ethylene from carbon emissions, you no longer have to rely on steam cracking. And steam cracking is uh, how we currently make our ethylene. It takes naphtha and it takes, or it takes ethane. It heats them up with natural gas at very, very high temperatures. And it basically cracks apart these molecules to form ethylene. That process releases between 1 and 1.7 tons of CO2 every year. And it's currently responsible for 260 million tons of F um, CO2 emissions each year. So what we want to do is basically two things. Number one, we want to turn carbon emissions into renewable energy. So we want to take carbon emissions, add some renewable energy, and form ethylene. And number two, we wanted to do it at zero green premium. So green premium is a term you'll hear people like myself talking about in climate tech technology. It refers to the extra price you pay for a product that's made from a, uh, sorry, from a green source compared to the fossil equivalent. So typically, you'll find that industries do not want to pay more for their chemicals. So if a chemical is green, it has to be the same price as the fossil equivalent for it to really, of the fossil equivalent, for it to really take off. So we said if, we, if right now the ethylene price is 0 0.9 to 1.4 euros per kilo in Europe, we are going to make that ethylene for 0 0.9 to 1.4 euros per kilo. When we started the company, there really wasn't any technology that could do this. So one technology you can imagine making ethylene is bioethanol dehydration. This is, you'll know a lot about bioethanol in France. It's, it's actually a very common industry here. Bioethanol is obviously where you just grow some crop. You can grow beetroot or sugarcane, and you then process that, sh that crop, get out the sugar, ferment the sugar, then you can turn the sugar into ethanol, and then you can dehydrate the ethanol in order to form ethylene. That process is not particularly um, good at making ethylene. It's very land intensive. It's carbon intensive. You, it's also seasonal. You can only do this when it's sunny or in the summer or the spring. And typically, the price of ethylene from this kind of technology is about 1.5 times that of the fossil price. Another interesting way of doing this was through electrolysis. So we just heard a lot about making hydrogen from electrolysis. And you could make ethylene through hydrogen production. What you'd essentially do is use some renewable energy or, or nuclear power uh, to make hydrogen from an electrolyzer. <laughs> You would then react the hydrogen you produce with CO2. Again, we just heard all about this. I actually have a huge section teaching you about this, but I think you just learned about electrolysis. And then you can turn the CO2 into ethylene. Eth electrolysis in general is a very good way of turning electrical energy into chemical energy. And again, you just heard about this. So I won't go into more detail. But what you can essentially do is put a voltage across these individual cells. And when you do so, you, you are taking 
energy from one side, taking, turning water into oxygen, and on another, another side, you're turning water into hydrogen. When you do electrolysis of water, you're essentially storing about 33 kilowatt hours of energy per kilo of hydrogen you produce in those hydrogen bonds. So what you can do is say, okay, I made hydrogen, great. I can now react that hydrogen with CO2, but you can't just turn that CO2 straight into ethylene. It's too complicated. You need to first react the hydrogen with the CO2 to make methanol. And once you form that methanol, you can react the methanol together to make ethylene. So this is how you can imagine making ethylene using a hydrogen electrolyzer. But unfortunately, you can see, sorry, I didn't say, there are a number of byproducts there. So you're not just making ethylene, you're making a huge amount of other stuff. They all need to be separated. And when you look into the overall process chain of this kind of reaction, because you have to put together all of these different processes, the water electrolyzer, the methanol synthesis, the methanol to olefins, the cryogenic distillation of those gases. Actually, I would have loved to talk to the other um, companies um, just about their, their vision of this kind of technology. Those process chains cost a lot of money and ultimately mean that this kind of technology will be two to three times higher than the fossil price for ethylene. So there's this really huge technical gap. We didn't have a way to turn carbon emissions into ethylene, which prevents us from having that beautiful route to turn all of those carbon emissions into all those everyday chemicals and fuels. That's why we found a Dioc cycle. So we found a Dioc cycle with the idea that we would provide a technology that can take carbon emissions and turn them into sustainable, affordable ethylene with no premium on that ethylene. So at the same price as the fossil cost. We do this by greatly simplifying the process. We do that conversion in one step. The technology is another electrolyzer. I think you just heard about them. I'm going to talk to you about what's unique about ours. In, our, in most electrolyzer cases, you're putting water in and you're just doing standard water electrolysis. In our case, we don't put water, well, we, we do add some water, but on one side, we put carbon emissions. And basically what you have is a series of stacked plates. The carbon emissions go into those plates. They have specific grooves which are used to transport the carbon emission from a central emission stream to a central catalytic core. And on that catalytic core, we have specific catalysts that are taking undertaking the transformation of that carbon emission into ethylene. And the overall process looks like this. We have one catalyst doing carbon emission conversion to ethylene, another catalyst doing water oxidation to oxygen, and a membrane in the center which basically balances this process through the transfer of some ions. And this is really the key. This is our technical innovation. This is what we've been working on for the past three years. And I will say as a little Disclaimer, we're only three years old as a company, so we don't have the cool pitches and the cool factories that the other two companies have had today. But I hope you appreciate there's still a lot of science that we've been, been doing over the past few years. So um, the, the real th uh, metrics we needed to improve upon to get the electrolyzer, uh, sorry, to get the price of the ethylene we produce as low as possible were these three metrics. We needed to get the voltage low, the current density high, and the lifetime even higher. So the, the voltage is essentially the energy efficiency of the process. The lower the voltage you can achieve, the less electricity you need to put into this process to form ethylene. And that basically is your operating costs. The higher the current density you can achieve, the smaller the electrolyzer has to be for a given conversion of carbon emission into ethylene. So the less money you have to put down to begin with to build your electrolyzer. And the other thing we need to maximize is the lifetime. The longer the lifetime, the longer time you have before you have to change the electrolyzer, which again adds to your capital cost. And it's by reducing the capital and operating costs come together, which is leading us to produce that ethylene at a low, low price point that competes with fossil fuels. The way we've been working on improving these metrics has really been by optimizing this catalytic core. The, the key for us was this catalyst that does the conversion of the carbon emission to ethylene. Optimizing that catalytic core was really essential for us to get our technology off the ground. The anode we did a lot of work on, but we were able to um, basically optimize this based on some of the existing information from the water electrolysis field, but the cathode we had to design ourselves. And the cathode is actually exerting its, um, the, the cathode has to do a very interesting number of electron and proton transfers in order to turn carbon emissions into ethylene. It has to essentially take a carbon gas, bind it to the surface, and consecutively allow water and carbon and other carbon gases to come together to facilitate that tr transformation all the way from carbon emissions to ethylene. 
And that process is incredibly complex. We need the perfect balance of carbon gas and water at the same time and electricity in order to facilitate that tr transformation from carbon emissions to ethylene. And that's all we've been doing. Um, not all we've been doing, but for the past three years, we have been focused incredibly intently on improving that catalytic reaction. Because basically, we have a very unique feed in the carbon emission electrolyzer. We do need some water. Water is very dense. Uh, but we do, importantly, need that carbon emission gas, too. The water tends to displace gas as, you know, basic, <coughs> basic uh, physics there. So it's, if you get too much water in your electrolyzer, you will form exclusively hydrogen. If you form hydrogen, you, you're not doing this electrolyzer right at all. We need the right combination of carbon gases and water at the same time if we're going to form that ethylene. To do this, we use something called a gas diffusion electrode. A gas diffusion electrode is a carbon fiber, a hydrophobic carbon fiber, which has on top a catalyst layer. So there's the gas part and there's a catalyst part. The gas part is very, very good at keeping water out and allowing gas to flow. The catalyst part is actually a little bit hydrophilic and allows liquid next to the, catal next to the um, catalyst. And those two things combined, the gaseous gas diffusion, sorry, the gas friendly gas diffusion layer and the liquid friendly catalyst layer enable us to form this perfect environment where we have both a high concentration of gas and enough liquid in order to turn carbon emissions into ethylene. Uh, it's not just us who have discovered this, uh, the academic field as well, Mark will know a lot about this as well, have been looking into these electrolyzers, these kind of electrodes for electrolysis and actually after the discovery of these uh, gas diffusion electrodes, we have seen a huge increase in the activity of these electrodes for carbon emission transformation. So this is the last 30 years. This is every, uh, actually this stops in 2022, but this is every report before 2022 who had mentioned a gas diffusion electrode in their system. And you can see in the past seven years, the reporting of these electrodes has exploded. And with it, the current density, the rate of transformation of carbon emission to ethylene has exploded too. The one area where, oh, and I should say, we got very good as a company at making these electrodes. So this is a carbon, this is a carbon fiber I was talking about. This is the catalyst on top. We got incredibly good at making these electrolyzers for the transformation of carbon emissions into ethylene. The one area where there really was not enough work was in efficiency and lifetime. So the carbon electrolysis field, I should just let you know, it isn't, we're not the only ones working on it. It has been in development for the past 10 years. And unfortunately, the one area where the field has not made enough progress is in efficiency and lifetime. So a commercial and industrial water electrolyzer will typically last uh, 50,000 hours or more and will be 60 to 70% efficient. You can see that the reported cases for electrolyzers for carbon electrolysis were less than 20% energy efficient in most cases and about 100 hours, which means we need to get from there all the way over here. And this is a logarithmic scale in order to form something even close to a water electrolyzer. And that was our grand challenge as a company. I can't go into the results we've had and our progress in getting to these targets, but I will tell you about how we got there. Uh, for the past three years, my co-founder and I and the rest of the team have just been with our heads down, working like crazy, testing these electrodes again and again and again. So the first thing we did was get to Bordeaux and build our lab. We built our lab in three months. This is actually in the ICMCB down in uh, Pesac in Bordeaux. We built a lab in the first three months that was designed for the very quick building, construction, testing uh, of these electrodes that allowed us to very rapidly understand better this technology and improve our electrolyzer more and more to make it commercially viable. After yeah, there's a lot of this, obviously, you can imagine three months of uh, time-lapsed footage actually lasts a very long time. But this is the first thing we did. We quickly began, we became too big for that lab, so we built a second lab. This one tripled our testing capacity, and with that lab in place, we were able to very rapidly understand all of the bottlenecks of this technology, all the ways we could overcome those bottlenecks, and exactly what we needed to do in order to make these carbon electrolyzers commercially viable. This is our roadmap. It's not anywhere near as long as the other roadmaps you've seen today, but this is what we've achieved over the last three years. So before Dark Cycle was founded, uh, like, I, like Mark mentioned, I was a researcher, so I was at the Stanford University, but before that, I was at the Collège de France. There we really understood the f fundamentals of this technology, made sure that we basically were, could 
imagine pitching a company to investors that wouldn't just completely embarrass ourselves. So that's where we understood exactly what was possible with this technology. And then in 2021, we secured $1 million in funding, which allowed us to take the company, basically allowed us to jump off this metaphorical cliff in order to form the company. The first thing we did was increase the scale of our electrolyzer by 1,500 times to show uh, potential industrial clients that this technology could work at the, um, at the industrial scale. <clears throat> Excuse me. Following that, we raised another $2 million uh, and also got some grants in as well. And that money was used to uh, increase dramatically the efficiency and the lifetime of our electrolyzers. And after hitting some milestones, we raised our Series A in 2023, which uh, was $17 million, which we're now using to build our first commercial pilot, which will prove this reaction, this reactor, will be able to convert carbon emissions to ethylene at the industrial scale. And uh, I mentioned before, we're looking for partners now, and it's very important at this stage that we, that we begin finding partners who will be able to facilitate this electroly electrolyzer installation on their sites. And fortunately, we found some very, very good partners who are very excited by this kind of technology. Because although it's very easy to imagine industrial emitters as you know, the, the evil guys in an 80s movie, these, these typically are given a very bad press, but they do want greener technologies, it's just they have a number of constraints. So when we said we have a technology for you which can make ethylene from emissions at very similar prices to the fossil equivalent, they were very, very interested. And these, in general, these, these off-takers industri and industrial emitters, they're facing increasing tax incentives to bring down their emissions. They are facing volatile fossil resource costs, which we heard about in the talk from um, Waga Energy. And we are, they, they are being basically demand they have demands from people like us who require sustainable feedstocks we want to buy sustainable feedstocks we don't want to be buying things that have been derived from fossil fuels anymore so for them the technology is very interesting and we've been able to obviously offer them a route to completely alleviate themselves from their dependence on the steam cracker and with our technology compared to the steam cracker which was releasing one to 1.7 tons of CO2 for every ton of ethylene produced, we're actually able to abate three to four tons for every ton of ethylene we produce. The reason we abate so much is because we're not only recycling one to two emissions of CO2 in order to make that ethylene, we're also preventing the use of the steam cracker for every molecule of ethylene we make. So overall, by using our technology, we're preventing three to four tons of CO2 from entering the atmosphere every year for every ton of ethylene they buy. And like I say, we are working on the technological blocks we need to achieve all of this production at the same price as the fossil alternative. And we really believe those two things combined are key for uh, our goal, our goal of a rapid rollout of this technology. And we hope by 2050 to achieve our goal of being able to decarbonize 700 million tons of CO2 every year with these electrolyzers by completely replacing the steam crackers, which are a huge uh, burden on our um, society today. That's, uh, I think, that's it. Yep, I've taken all my time. Uh, I'm just going to very, all good. <laughs> I'm just finishing up here by showing you the team growing over the past um, three years. We are a, we just began as two people three years ago. We're now 22 people. Uh, we have a big lab in Saint-Ouen in Paris, which uh, this is a photo from I'm opening. We have, um, we raised 26 million in funding from some top VCs. So we have the backing of Bill Gates's Breakthrough Energy Ventures, Chris Sacker's Lower Carbon Capital, and Gigascale Capital, which is founded by the former CTO of Facebook, Mike Schrepfer. These venture capital companies have been instrumental in getting the company off the ground. We have, uh, we have some great expertise on the team too, so we, I don't say we stole, but we have, we, we have hired Luc Rivière. He was formerly the CTO and co-founder of Sambio, which is a fuel cell company down in Lyon. And um, we now have uh, just a fantastic team, a number of patents. And if you're looking for a job, uh, we are still hiring. <laughs>